Good morning, folks. We're very, very glad that you could join us for this webinar on Bid Challenges, International Perspectives. This is one of a series of webinars that we at GW Law School have held in conjunction with uh, King's College Law School, uh, King's College London uh, Law School, with uh, Michael Bauscher, our, our, very, uh, our very cherished colleague there. Uh, Michael, um, if you'd like to say hello. Hello. It's greetings. For, it's, a, it's a great pleasure for us at King's uh, to be able to join. Thank you very much. We have a very um, a varied panel this morning, uh, really in, in an attempt to show our audience the diversity of bid challenge practice around the world. As, as you probably know, bid challenges are opportunities to challenge either the terms of a solicitation or the outcome of a procurement. Uh, they're a very important part of uh, procurement practice around the world. They're actually, uh, as we're gonna learn this today, they're, they're, they're an ancient practice. Um, we're gonna be talking about four basic questions uh, involving bid challenges, including the first one, an important one, what, what the purposes are. Um, we're gonna we're going be talking in large part about the procedures for bid challenges. And those procedures are, are roughly uniform from country to country. And they're, they're framed by the UN uh, model of procurement law. The UNCTRAL model of procurement law gives you a good example, a good a way to frame, to think about these big challenges that they can be brought either at the agency itself or they can be brought at an independent agency. For example, um, Ken Patton is joining us from the Government Accountability Office, which is the independent agency that hears bid challenges in the US government, or they can be brought in a court um, in the United States, it's the US Court of Federal Claims, or there are, and, and different courts in different countries can, can hear bid challenges. And we'll be talking about that uh, today. So same basic structure, but the nuances can vary a great deal. So for example, who can bring a bid challenge varies a great deal from country to country or, or how the bid challenge will unfold. So we be talking about those again to get a sense of how diverse bid challenge practice is but really and this is the point i really want to stress the the most important aspect of this session of this webinar today is for bid practitioners and policymakers, lawyers folks in the procurement community around the world really to understand that bid challenges exist everywhere and people are doing the same sort of thing around the world so we can really learn from each other as we go along this is an opportunity to open up the, uh, the international community. Michael and I had a session like this at King's College London a few years ago. Uh, we were joined by Ken Patton's colleague, um, Ralph White at that session, but we, because we had it in person at King's College, only about 50 or 100 people could, could join that session there at King's College. By going online, by doing this in a virtual forum, we're able to include many more people. And we had um, over 350 people signed up for today with over, from over 30 countries from, from five continents around the world. So just quickly, I'm uh, gonna give you a little back on our panelists before we start. Kasia Kuzma is a, a panel, uh, excuse me, is a partner at DCP in uh, Warsaw. She's a, um, a specialist in procurement law. She, she heads their, um, uh, their, uh, their practice in um, the, uh, she's, excuse me, the, um, excuse me, gosh, I apologize, gosh, I was going by the pictures rather than by the alphabet. Um, she has a firm's public procurement and environmental protection teams with her colleague, Wojciech Hartung. She's a co-author of Co Combating Collusion on Public Procurement. Wojciech was part of our webinar on bitter collusion that was held on uh, June 2nd. And that webinar is available on publicprocurementinternational.com, which is where the information on today's session is. And it's also available on the GW Law a YouTube page. Christina Akara, and one of our program coordinators, is an associate general counsel with Battelle in Columbus, Ohio. She has many years of experience as an in-house counsel with major U.S. corporations. She'll be discussing the uh, U.S. the in-house counsel's perspective. She's co-chair of the International Procurement Committee in the American Bar Association's Public Contract Law Section, and we're coordinating the session with several committees of the Public Contract Law Section. Um, Michael Boucher, who we just heard from, is a, a QC. He's a senior barrister in the Moncton Chambers in London. He's a leading procurement lawyer in the United Kingdom. He's active in many of the leading uh, procurement cases there. He's done many big challenges, both in the United Kingdom and in, in the Repo Republic of Ireland. He's a visiting professor at King's College London, and he's helped build this, this series of programs with me. Um, and we've been very, very grateful that we've been able to do that. Matt Carter is a lawyer at Pillsbury Winthrop in Los Angeles. He's handled over 50 bid protests at the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, at the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, and before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So for the foreigners, just to put their geography clear, so Matt is three time zones away. He is in Los Angeles, and he does practice in Washington, D.C. So for us as Americans, one of the open questions is, if Matt can practice in Washington, D.C., 
why can't he do bid protests in the intervening 47 states? Um, and that's an open question that we're dealing with as a bar uh, in the United States. David Drabkin recently serves as the chairman of the Section 809 panel. It was a blue ribbon panel that generated, at the Congress's direction, um, generated a list, uh, a, a extensive compendium of recommendations for reform of, of acquisition. Um, he previously worked for the Defense Department and the U.S. General Services Administration. You'll be hearing the acronym GSA this morning several times as a senior procurement executive. He and I are going, he's going to play a leading role with me in a study that's been mandated by Congress under Section 886 of last year's Defense Authorization Act. And that study, which is on bid protests at the Defense Department, that study will start rolling, we think, early um, next month. Laurence Foliolalio teaches at the University of Paris, Nanterre, where she's a full professor of public law and has served as director of the Public Law Research Center and co-director of the master's degree in law and economics. Uh, she participates in the GOMAC, GOMAP director team, a master's degree in public procurement governance organized by the International Labor Organization, Sciences Po, and the University of Turin. And she teaches at the Public Procurement Regulatory Program in Senegal. She's on the steering committee of the Public Contracts and Legal, Legal Globalization International, Inter, International Academic Network. Network. That's an international network of professors that generates, um, uh, we generate comparative works in public procurement law. And importantly, she was the co-editor of a book on bid challenges within the network. And that is included on our program information page. If you go to the bottom, look at the resources, and there's a click. I've posted there a number of chapters from that book. So you can look at, for instance, comparative studies in China or the United States, their bid challenge systems there. Michal Kani is a professor at the University of Silesia in Katowice, Poland, and a former Fulbright scholar with us at George Washington University Law School. He's a recognized expert in public-private partnerships, and especially for this program, he's prepared a summary of bid challenges in the Polish public procurement system, and that he's going to be talking about that in our, during our discussion, but that summary is also available on the resources page. Anna Maria Lakimia is a professor of law and development in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Nottingham. She directs the world-renowned Public Procurement Research Group at the University of Nottingham, established in the School of Law in 1998 by our dear colleague, Professor Sue Aerosmith. And, the, and that program is going to hold a free online version of their Public Procurement Global Revolution Conference on June 22nd, June 22nd, next week. And that information can be linked through our resources page, or you can just go to the Public Procurement Research Group at, um, at the University of Nottingham, their, their website. Paul Lalonde is a partner in the Toronto offices of Dentists and one of Canada's most decorated experts on government procurement. He speaks annually on Canadian public procurement and trade developments at the Thomson Reuters Government Contracts Year in Review, and he helps coordinate Denton's Global Bid Protest Tracker, which is a um, resource on bid protests and bid challenges around the world, which is discussed, which is also linked on our, on our website. Ken Patton is Managing Associate General Counsel in the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GAO Office of the General Counsel. He oversees GAO's bid protest function and is responsible for leading and managing the attorneys and administrative staff responsible for resolving the protests on the GAO, the leading forum for bid challenges. There's several thousand filed every year at the uh, GAO. Geo Kino is the director of the African Public Procurement Re uh, Public, excuse me, African Public Procurement Regulation Research Unit at and a fellow of the Chiuchi Center for Law and Social Development based at the law faculty at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Professor Kino is a professor in the Department of Public Law at Stellenbosch, where he teaches administrative law and constitutional law. He also serves as the current editor of the Stellenbosch Law Review Journal. We've been very privileged to, to work with Stellenbosch in South Africa, and, um, and Echeo and his colleagues at Stellenbosch are really leaders in developing um, procurement law in sub-Saharan Africa. Gabriela Araca is a full professor of administrative law in the Department of Management of the University of Turin. She and I regularly work together um, and, on editing volumes through the uh, academic network that I mentioned before. She's a coordinator of the U.S. Publicum Network, founded in 2011 with the aim of following the, the devolution of public procurement law through some of the leading journals. She's a regular academic contributor to the international discourse on in public procurement. Johannes Schnitzer serves as Managing Counsel, Global Public Sector, McKinsey and Company, based in Vienna. Um, I think he's, Johannes has got the best job in the world. He's working for a New York-based international consultancy, and he is housed in Vienna. So 
You're, you're right. I'm not complaining. It's, crazy. it's a real coup. <laughs> <laughs> he manages an international team of lawyers handling public procurement matters for McKinsey. A lot of our students are participating today, and Johannes has, for our students who are interested in international procurement, Johannes has the job you want, which is Johannes is, Mara is managing global procurement for very sophisticated international, global procurement law issues for very sophisticated international companies. He was previously in private practice. He has many years of experience in European bid remedies procedures. Roland Stein is a partner in the Blumstein Law Firm in Berlin and a highly regarded procurement lawyer in Germany. He's a co-chair of the IBA subcommittee on exclusions and debarments and a member of the board of the Forum Contracting Association, as well as a co-leader of the Defense and Security Division of Forum Fagaba, a leading German procurement group. Andreas Sundstein is a lecturer in public law at Stockholm University with a special focus on public procurement law. She's course director of the advanced course on public procurement law and of two online courses on public procurement law. She also teaches public procurement law with us at GW Law School. We're very happy to have her join us every year and at King's College London and at Tartu University in Tallinn. She also is a formal matter. Um, Andrea is the, is, the, is the mother leader of the Swedish procurement bar, and uh, Michael Boucher and I have been very, very grateful to join her annual conferences in Stockholm, where she really convenes the uh, Swedish um, procurement bar and, and many members of, of the bar across the Scandinavian countries. Last but not least, Peter Trepte is a senior fellow in public procurement law and deputy director of the Public Procurement Research Group at the University of Nottingham. He coordinates the Public Procurement Global Revolution conferences there, the one I mentioned before, the, the free online version is being held next week. He's of counsel with Grayston and Company and a barrister with Littleton Chambers and is one of the world's most respected voices on development and public procurement law. Thank you for all that and uh, thank you for your patience with the introductions, but we really we do want to get a diverse set of voices from around the world. Let's open up with the first question which is, what is the purpose of bid challenges? How have they involved, evolved? And, and Kasha, um, we, you know, we, we had some chances to prepare for, the, for today. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, from your perspective as, as a lawyer um, and as a, as a person who's worked in procurement for some time, what you view, based on also on the Polish experience and the European experience, what you view the purposes are of, of, um, of, a, of a bid challenge? Uh, thank you, Chris. Fra uh, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for having me today. Uh, so the simple answer to your question should be probably that big challenges improve the effective and lawful application of public procurement law. So in fact, for contractors, big challenges are the most efficient, if not the only one way to protect uh, their interests. Contractors understand challenges primarily as a means of winning the challenge contract. But in my opinion, challenges should be also seen um, as a very important factor in protecting the market itself and fair competition. And from this perspective, it is crucial that big challenges be available when a contract is awarded without public procurement rules being applied or when the contracting authorities make direct awards without publication or competition or which is very difficult to follow when the contracting authorities make unlawful changes to an existing contract. So legal mechanism ensuring that, uh, ensuring that in these cases, so in cases that a contract signed in violation of public procurement rules can be declared invalid or, ter or terminated are also very important from my opinion. But in order to achieve these objectives, Bidders mu must have timely access to information about contracting authorities' decisions. Because if the access to information is restricted or limited in an unlawful way, so bidders will be unable to identify possible violations of law. So for example, in Poland, we the access to tender documentation, including competitors' bids, is very broad. So though this raises and other concerns about the need to protect trade secrets or about how, how this broad access to information could damage competition in the end. And uh, so there are another factors also influencing in the system itself, and it could be the need to preserve the status quo during, uh, during a big challenge through an automatic standstill and suspension of a challenge contract combined, if possible, with an interim injunction. So in Poland, for example, the standstill and automatic suspension remain in place until the first instance 
review body, which is uh, the National Appeal Chamber, issues a judgment. But afterwards, the public contract may be signed and no interim injunctions are granted. So this makes a further appeal, a second and finally a first instance review, basically useless in most cases. And last but not least, the bid challenge system must be coordinated with possibility of claiming damages for violations of public procurement law. Unfortunately, in most, most European countries, damages are an undeveloped aspect of the bid challenge systems. And for example, throughout my working life, I have had only one case, one single case of an actual claim for damages. Although many of my clients uh, have analyzed the possibility of claiming for damages, but finally concluded that it was not worth it because the chances of, of being successful were so low. So as we will discuss later, I think that this issue should be probably improved because it can have a negative impact on the entire bid challenge system. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia. I hope that uh, in a bit, Paul will be talking about the possibility of damages, and I know that Michael will be talking about them as well from the from the Canadian, from the UK perspective. Um, I have to say that um, in, in our work internationally, one of the interesting things we've seen is that in countries where there are the most severe issues in procurement, for example, issues of, of incompetence or corruption arise, those are the countries where there is more universal support for a strong damages um, system, a strong, a strong remedy of damages in order to encourage more big challenges to be brought. Um, well, Chris, to just jump in there, if, if I may, um, I, I mean, I don't think that's universally true, because if you think of South Africa, where integrity is really low in the procurement system, and um, the bid challenge system should be dominated by concerns around corruption and low efficiency, we see the exact opposite. Um, there's, there's absolutely no uh, appetite for compensation or any form of uh, monetary damages. Now, of course, that may be linked to the purpose, which is, is more at a constitutional level. But I think it's an interesting example where that trend is certainly not playing out. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Christine, I want to turn to you. Uh, we, what I'd like to, because so Kasha framed for us what are the, some of the key issues that drive big challenge systems, both in Europe and really around the world. Um, Christine, I wonder if you could talk about, as we unpack it from a different direction, what are some of the considerations that a, an in-house counsel, that a, a counsel for a corporation would bring to considering a possible bid challenge? Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, there's definitely a complex interaction of stakeholders and considerations from my perspective the in-house perspective, the first bucket of stakeholders is really the business people. Um, in my experience, uh, even the most senior business leaders are reluctant to file protests out of fear that it'll negatively impact the relationship with the customer and thus impact future contract awards. Um, so there's some education you know, that has to be had there. Um, you know, it's not a popular topic when we're getting ready to file, um, you know, to respond to a bid uh, with the government as part of the management um, approval of that bid being submitted. We actually um, plan for a protest and I ask questions, you know, um, under what circumstances would we protest this award? Who's going to pay for the outside legal costs? Are you expecting the legal department to pay, or will the business pay? Those costs are unallowable. We, you know, um, cannot seek reimbursement from the U.S. government. We may receive, if we're successful, a small amount of attorney's fees um, from the court um, if we're successful. Um, also, who's going to be on the team that reviews the government's debrief and provides technical input? It should be a team that's separate from the team that worked on the initial um, bid submittal just to make sure um, you know, we're not drinking our own Kool-Aid as um, the slogan goes. You know, From a technical perspective, do we think that the government made a mistake in awarding um, to somebody else? The second bucket is really sort of the, you know, the Profit and loss, look at it and the deadlines. You know, economics do play an important factor in the decision to file. Easily, legal fees could be a million dollars. And in this action in the United States, um, 
incumbent contractors will normally file at the Government Accountability Office because it automatically triggers a stay without a hearing or further approval as long as you've um, submitted your protest on time. So that means likely the incumbent contractor is going to remain in that role and receive more funding, a bridge contract, um, until the case is decided. And that means that there's going to be, you know, more profit in that time. Um, and then also, you know, we consider our employees as well. You know, they get to remain an employee of our organization um, during that time. Um, you know, one note, the, the GAO has strict initial filing deadlines that must be adhered to. Um, actions brought at the Court of Federal Claims do not, but um, they do not automatically issue a stay without a hearing. So that's a consideration. And then really the third bucket is, um, you know, I always recommend having, you know, a few law firms you trust on standby prior to the award, um, anticipating when that award is going to be made. It's possible one or more of the firms that you prefer has a conflict and represents another party in the matter that's adverse to your own interests. Um, having those firms know your business in advance, there's not much time to react once the contract has been awarded. And again, plan, you know, planning is key because in my experience, the US government is known for making awards on a Friday afternoon or just before a holiday when certainly all of the people you need to bring together are um, uh, planning on doing something else with their time and not listening to their lawyer about a uh, bid protest. So thank you, that's my perspective. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Christina. So we so we had we've had bid challenges here in the United States since 1926, and we're going to hear from Gabriel Arac in a few minutes. We've actually had them for for centuries in, in other countries. Um, so and they're actually now part of Article Nine of the UN Convention Against Corruption. So they're an entrenched part of international law, but they, they continue to be very controversial here in the United States. And in, in response to those concerns, the Section 809 panel that David Drapkin headed, the Section 809 panel asked Congress to set, lay out in statute what the purposes are of, of bid protests, because there's so many conflicting purposes as you're going to, as you're hearing in international, in the international experience, and also in the US experience. Um, that, that question that the Section 809 panel that, that David headed um, asked is really in many ways a launching point um, for both for this forum and also for the study that he and I will be working on. Um, he previously served, served as a senior procurement official at GSA, um, and he was this, uh, he's also in that role, he was responsible not only for overseeing procurements as a very senior uh, agency official, but also responsible for overseeing the agency bid protest function. And I, I wonder, David, if you could talk just for a couple minutes about how, in the Section 809 panel, how you dealt with that question, the controversy surrounding bid protests. Well, well, to begin with, the Section 809 panel was charged at looking at the Department of Defense's acquisition system in the U.S., and only that system. We did address some tangential issues that affected other agencies, but our focus was on DOD. We began our work by agreeing amongst the commissioners that uh, the focus of the acquisition system in DOD should be delivering capability to warfighters inside the turn of near peer competitors and non-state actors and anything else was a distraction from the purpose of getting things to our warfighters so that they could do their job in defending the nation and, uh, and trying to defeat the, the fact that some of our near peer competitors might get it faster. In that vein, a number of practitioners, and, and in this context, I'm not talking about lawyers. I'm talking about the people who actually bought stuff on behalf of the department, complained that protests were a problem. Uh, when we looked at the issue, trying to figure out exactly what problem protests were, uh, it turns out that statistically they're insignificant. The number of protests filed each year uh, is less than 1%. In fact, it's less than half a percent in terms of the overall number of contracting actions we executed. And so then in trying tr to figure out how do you measure the efficacy of the protest process, uh, we look to see, well, why do we have one in the first place? And it turns out that protests in the United States were actually by accident. Somebody wrote the then uh, general accounting office 
and complained of, over a construction contract in 1924 that they argued had been awarded uh, to someone who wasn't eligible for the award. And the Comptroller General at the time said, well, you know, I get to decide what bills get paid, had no protest authority, word hadn't even been invented uh, in that context. And so under his authority to decide whether bills got paid, he said that the contract had been inappropriately awarded and that um, they wouldn't pay the bill. And so that's how protests were birthed in the US procurement system. Over time, uh, that got built up uh, and, and became more and more uh, used once people understood. And by the way, the word protest came from the description by the Comptroller General in his decision that he had received someone protesting the award. So that's where the word came from. In the 1940s, uh, Justice Black in the Perkins Steel case uh, reviewed an allegation by somebody that got to the Supreme Court that uh, protests were inappropriate. And in that decision, Justice Black wrote uh, that uh, you only get to protest a government contracting action if the government gives you the right and left it there. And the government in that particular case hadn't given uh, the right to protest. Uh, Congress later on uh, in the 80s, 1980s, uh, in the um, uh, added protests first time in statute, but in so doing, it never said why we had them. So we can't measure whether they're doing their job unless you know what the purpose of having protests were. So having said that, we did one more look. We went back and talked to all of the people in the Department of Defense who were responsible for buying things. And we talked to all of their lawyers who were responsible for uh, assisting them in uh, making sure they were complying with the law. And every one of them said, protests are important because they help us keep ourselves honest but that they didn't see protests as a tool to comp compensate an unsuccessful offeror. And so in the end, the panel recommended to Congress that they adopt a purpose statement, which we could use going forward to measure whether protests were achieving the purpose that Congress would set out for protests. And we, and we offered at that time that that purpose was to protect the integrity of the government procurement process without regard to whether or not an unsuccessful offer or got compensated because something went wrong. That might well be a benefit to the unsuccessful offer or, but that wasn't the purpose of the process. By the way, that's recommendation 66 of our report. You can find it online. It's a fair, of all of our recommendations, it's one of the briefest. The, the actual report's over 1,800 pages long and three volumes, but uh, that one is brief, uh, although it is well documented and footnoted, even if I do say so myself. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> so I want, I want to turn to uh, Roland Stein. And if, Roland, if you could talk a little bit about how, from the German perspective, how big challenges have evolved over time. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think just before I start, um, you know, I was, Regardless of all the differences, there seem to be some similarities. Uh, you know, Christina, when you were referring to the calls on a Friday afternoon or just before Christmas or Easter, you know, that's exactly the same over here. And, you know, that's when procurement lawyers try, tend to be very, uh, you know, <laughs> passionate about the things they have to, to, to have it done by Saturday or whenever. Um, so I think the way that uh, bid protest started here in Germany, you know, pretty much as David was saying is, you know, when the bills got paid, you know, it was all part of the budgetary law. Uh, so there was no, you know, subjective legal rights which could be uh, brought to, to court. Um, and Germany was really forced uh, for uh, individual legal rights uh, by the remedies directive. Um, and, you know, nowadays, um, you know, I think this budgetary law is all a long history. And we have over 1,000 uh, bid protests a year here. Um, and what I think is it's a bit more more recent history is the way uh, the, the procurement reviews are changing. Um, I think the, the, the his, you know the more original or the original way was that you, you attack the flaw 
uh, within a public procurement procedure. Uh, and I think that is now being broadened to other issues around other companies uh, or contracting authorities. Um, so just uh, as a way of an example, uh, we are um, uh, fighting a dispute around the purchase of uh, autom automatic rifles for the German MOD. Uh, and there, uh, the, the allegations that are being decided by the review chamber are whether one or more bidders uh, are breaching patent laws from the other bidder or from a third party. Uh, and you know, that raises all you know, procedural legal uh, questions. You know, how do you deal with a you know, very technically complex patent law issue within a procurement procedure, which is supposed to happen uh, very quickly, right? So I think that's that strike. It's not, you know, the courts haven't decided yet how that strike should be balanced. I think it's just an example of how the, the, this, all this process is broadening. Um, and another broadening is taking part with regard to bit rigging, uh, where really courts are more and more uh, trying to look how to deal with that anti-competitive issues uh, within procurement procedure. Yeah. Thank you very Roland, much, Roland. Can I just jump in very quickly with Absolutely. On, on what Roland just said? Uh, Roland, when you said a thousand protests a year, is that relating to central government, central German government procurements alone or, or public yeah. procurement yeah. throughout the country at all levels? That's at all levels. So I think, uh, I guess, at central level, that should be around 200 cases and the others relate to regional disputes. Thanks. So we've been hearing about um, bid, bid challenge systems that are really focused on um, internal administrative issues largely. Um, Hale, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the South African experience and how uh, bid challenges in South Africa also, also deal with larger issues of social justice. Yes, thank you, um, Chris. <clears throat> so it's quite interesting also just reflecting on the historical development because in South Africa now, the purpose of our bid challenge system, which is uh, broadly dominated by judicial review in our normal high courts, um, is now quite clearly premised on uh, constitutional, large constitutional issues. And that's simply because um, our current fairly recent constitution of 1996, our, our um, uh, post-apartheid uh, democratic constitution, has constitutionalized procurement law. So we've got an explicit provision in our constitution setting out the basic principles of public procurement law. And from that, the entire dispute resolution mechanism has also now flown um, to be um, premised on judicial review. But implicitly, then, it's a constitutional issue. So when you're coming to court on a bid protest in South Africa, you are really in front of the court on a constitutional question. And our courts have now come out, including our highest court, our constitutional court, which is probably the equivalent of the US Supreme Court, to say that the purpose of the mechanism and the remedy is really to pursue the public interest at the broadest level, um, conceptualized as legality or rule of law. Um, and, and, you know, that means that any benefit that may accrue to the individual um, disgruntled bidder, the, the applicant, is, is, is in incidental. It should really be about the larger legality issues. Now, of course, one can ask many questions about, you know, the reality of that, whether that is true, you know, would, would, would um, those kind of applicants um, truly be inspired by rule of law and legality concerns, or are they really there to pursue their own interests? And I think that's an interesting disconnect between the reality we're seeing and the overt um, purpose of, of the scheme. But I think what is also just very briefly, very interesting about the South African example is that there's been a clear shift uh, following the constitutionalization because the mechanism used here, judicial review of, of the state actions, a very old one, going back to about the 1890s, where it's quite interesting that the South African state, unlike um, the British state, remember we were a crown colony at that time, did not invoke um, crown immunity, which was still very common um, in, in Britain at the time, in England at the time, the South African courts just never accepted that and held the South African state, the government, liable for normal civil remedies, um, uh, regardless of any immunity that the Crown may have in these kind of arrangements. And if you look at those old cases, they were much more commercially orientated, with a much more commercial intent behind them to, to just hold the state to a contract as you would any other commercial party. 
And it's only really subsequent to the constitutionalization in, in 96 that we've now seen this major shift to our bid protest system and the remedies flowing from it to be really about constitutional concerns, high level constitutional concerns. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to Gabriela, and Gabriela is going to talk to us a little bit about this rich history in Italy, which I found endlessly fascinating. As I, we, we talked about during the prep session, um, Americans always think we, we think we invent everything so that we can now reinvent it, but it turns out that these things actually existed for hundreds of years beforehand. Gabriela, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the experience in Italy of the big challenges over the centuries. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Well, the experience in Italy, we had uh, records and claims uh, for against um, public contracts uh, since a long time. The perspective was uh, the same uh, at Germany and budgetary claims uh, for the benefit of the public administration. Uh, and then we had this tradition, but we didn't have the award of any damages. The great change come, came with the directive and then uh, the experience is similar to, uh, but very different because we have the same directive, but in Europe, the application of the remedies directive uh, come, takes to very different outcomes. So in Italy, for example, we had the problem that uh, the award of uh, high value damages till the 10% of the value of the contract uh, determine the raise of the number of claims uh, that uh, are uh, now we have uh, 3,000 uh, claims each year for, uh, in the first in instance and then uh, half nearly of this uh, in appeal uh, in the state council uh, so there was a huge uh, growth of number of claims so I, I really uh, looked at uh, the comparison with the US uh, with interest because uh, you don't have normally this uh, uh, idea of awarding damages that uh, sometimes uh, leads uh, uh, divert the objective of the, the, the vendors and the, the, the contractors to submit claims for having damages in uh, for a period of time in Italy they could uh, also ask just for damages and not to execute the contract so it was really uh, a, a great um, diversion to in, with respect of the aim of the claims so we have to correct this uh, now the the state council uh, had a different interpretation and so that the rate of uh, the award of damages uh, decreased and but we still have the great number of claims uh, are not concerning the award, so the competition rules and uh, uh, the award criteria, but are on the um, grounds for exclusion of the suppliers, so for the requirements of the suppliers. So one uh, contest that the other doesn't, uh, can't participate to the, 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 the procurement. So this is uh, really a, a situation that is quite uh, critical in Italy. And this doesn't affect uh, the integrity. That means uh, that all these uh, uh, claims and challenges doesn't help so much in getting integrity. So uh, the issues are there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriele. So, so quick comment and then a quick question. So the comment is, is as qualification information that's, that are public, the, that information on the qualification of contractors is published more internationally. For example, the World Bank is putting together a database about debarment from all over the world. They're putting together debarment information from countries all over the world. As that qualification information proliferates, it's more readily available for competitors who are likely to be even more challenges based on, on qualification in Italy. So that's, that's my comment. My question, Gabriela, I wanna make it clear for the Americans, in what century did bid challenges begin in Italy? Ah, yes, the late 18th century, we had already <laughs> So in what century did my country begin <laughs> in the late 18th century? <laughs> so you had big challenges as long as we've actually had a country. Oh, it's very, very interesting. So Michael, um, who is uh, in hiding somewhere in the south of France, <laughs> to, our, to our common anger and disgust. <laughs> Michael, what do you, what's your comment from the United Kingdom? What's your perspective? Right, well, uh, <laughs> There's been so much interesting comments so far, I would need 45 minutes to do justice to all the various points raised already. Um, and um, I should just emphasize my original, when I logged on, my original backdrop was intended to emphasize that all I'm usually here is from King's College London. I think I'm on the list here as practitioner, which is my day job, as it were. And that was, um, that was my sort of, my professional home behind me. Anyway, now, I'm, now, I'm, now I've got the holiday behind me. Um, a few thoughts. And um, picking up Hio's point, I mean, it's, uh, we were before 
the UK joined the EU, we were at the very, very early stages of developing um, some sort of sense that judicial review would apply to public contracts, but that would have been a public law challenge. It was at a very early stage. Um, and to some extent that was snuffed out by the fact that we then had to put in place an EU law implementation. And the choice was made to implement that as a private law claim. Um, and it was done in a way in the early 1990s in, that, that, that gave damages uh, almost, well, but made damages in, in the traditional common law way, the primary remedy, if adequate. And that has been, as it were, the driving force around everything that has released really so much about the effectiveness of the English and to some extent the Scottish system as well. <clears throat> um, as has already been mentioned in the chat, that's a system which is being looked at again as part of our ongoing reform. But part of the problem is that because it's a private law system, it's a system which uh, in, in which damages is the primary remedy and the court won't usually set aside a, an award decision if damages is available. And damages can include, can go up to and including full recovery of um, profit and, and, fi and, and fixed overhead. And of course also, different from the position which Christina described, we, because you're in a private law claim, you, the, the, the loser pays rule applies to costs. So you don't have to cover the costs. So what that means is in a, certainly in a large contract, um, the a very substantial amount of money is potentially available by way of damages. And that has a number of interesting effects. It certainly means that at the early stage of a discussion, if the CFO is in that early discussion and he's wondering whether this is worth, worth pursuing, it's so often the CFO who pulls the brakes back on, on, on litigation. But if he sees, well, actually I might get a bit of, a bit of profit for free, um, it certainly changes that initial dynamic. Um, <clears throat> it also means that at an early stage, the court, when deciding whether to set aside the contract or not, the court is likely to say, well, damages is an adequate remedy. This is an important public contract. Why shouldn't I let the, the state enter into this co contract and carry on doing its business? If, if it turns out you're right and it shouldn't have been awarded to that other guy, then you'll get, you'll get, you'll get a, nice, a nice watch of, of money. It also means that the trial itself will often be case managed by the court as a very substantial trial. And this means that it's a, often a trial with, as it were, the full Rolls-Royce version of disclosure, cross-examination and everything. And perhaps that's the biggest terror um, <clears throat> to, um, to, the, to, to the officials, because that means they're actually going to be cross-examined on by reference to their own contemporaneous documents. And that's the sort of the reputational the hazard um, involved. Uh, and, and then finally, and perhaps, well, well not finally, but uh, and further, it, it does also mean that there is a means of buying off litigation because so many, indeed the, the overwhelming majority of procurement challenges end up in settlement, probably in confidential settlement, often through ADR. Um, and I don't have time to go into whether that's the, a right, the right thing or not, but I have pretty strong prejudices about it. Uh, but that is the way it is. Um, and so the, the remedy system is not transparent. And the majority of cases in which the state has to pay out damages to rectify its perception of its past problems or errors are never made public and are probably always kept subject to confidentiality arrangements. Indeed, even some of the very largest settlements I've been involved in uh, going well in well over $100 million in one case and another one recently about 50 million. Um, you know, I could tell you all about them, but I'd have to kill you. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, Paul Lund, I just Paul's going to talk a little bit about um, uh, bid challenges in, in Canada. And I should just mention that as a point of contrast, Paul's going to be talking about the impact of bid challenges in Canada on trade issues. That in the United States, there's an open issue about whether or not foreign vendors will be able to enforce foreign trade agreements that open up the US federal market. And just importantly, we've been talking about the federal market in the United States. It's about a $600 billion marketplace. We haven't been talking about state and local where bid challenges are much more spotty. But at the federal level, there's a series of cases brought by a Danish construction company led by a Danish construction company called Per Arslev 
And that, that series of cases a couple of years ago left open the question about whether or not foreign vendors actually would be able to enforce trade agreements through our normal bid challenge mechanisms. Paul, do you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, about the experience in Canada? Yeah, sure. I, I feel a little bit like uh, Michael, uh, uh, overwhelmed by all the interesting things I want to respond to that I've heard from all the other speakers. But uh, let me focus on, on your question specifically. Um, yeah, Canada's bid challenge procedure, and I'm talking about federal government, government of Canada procurement at, at this point, not, uh, not local provincial uh, procurement. But uh, we have uh, 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 the possibility of court challenges to procurement decisions uh, through you know, traditional administrative law and common law remedies. Uh, but the main bid challenge mechanism that's been set up by statute in Canada uh, is, to my knowledge, rather unique in that its, its, its purpose isn't fairness to bidders or probity or accountability of procurement functions or fighting corruption or any of those perfectly laudable objectives. It's the implementation of uh, international trade agreements that Canada has entered into. So our bid challenge process is directly linked to the implementation of trade agreements like the WTO GPA, uh, the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, the precursor to NAFTA, which has now been replaced by the USMCA, and a series of other uh, bilateral and regional free trade agreements that Canada has entered into and that contain government procurement commitments. So to this day, Government of Canada bid challenges are before uh, a beast called the Canadian International Trade Tribunal, not a procurement tribunal specifically. It's a tribunal that han handles customs appeals and anti-dumping procedures and any number of other trade-related uh, uh, regulatory issues. And in addition to that, procurement challenges of, uh, of Government of Canada um, uh, procurements. Uh, the tribunal has some interesting powers. Uh, it, it can issue stop award orders. However, that's a weak power. It can uh, stop award orders can be reversed by the government declaring that proceeding is in the public interest, uh, notwithstanding the tribunal's order upon which the tribunal has to remove its order. And the tribunal can also award uh, 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 lost profits and, and has very broad discretionary powers to make whatever other orders it deems appropriate in order to remedy the violation of the trade agreement that's been observed. So there are instances of very high awards of lost profits to bidders, uh, but also other remedies, uh, sending the matter back for reconsideration by the authority uh, and any other number of, of remedies that, uh, that, that can be awarded, including uh, bid, uh, bid preparation costs in some instances, if that's the appropriate thing to remedy the prejudice that's been suffered by, by the bidder. So a really kind of unique uh, idiosyncratic model that's evolved uh, in Canada uh, that, uh, that I haven't seen another jurisdiction do it quite the way, uh, quite the way we do it. Interesting laboratory for uh, all you procurement geeks out there in the world who want to, want to study things like this. Yeah, I, actually, Paul, I see it less as idiosyncratic and rather for other nations setting a very high bar, really honoring the obligations under the international trade agreements to have an effective forum for addressing the trade issues. The, the trade agreements are set up so that there are, if there are trade problems, they can be challenged through the local bid challenge mechanism. And um, I think Canada's done a good job of, 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 of honoring that commitment. Yeah, I, I should add that... Um... You know, we, we haven't decided we only extend these rights to foreign bidders under the trade agreements, but domestic bidders are able to argue compliance with trade agreements, which sounds bizarre in a way, uh, but there you have it. That's how we've, we've set up the system. So we're not giving extra preferential bid challenge rights to foreign bidders as com compared to their domestic uh, competitors. Everybody gets, uh, gets these rights, so long as the uh, as the party is either domestic or uh, a, a company uh, that is from a member state of one of the trade agreements that's relevant to the matter. 
Thank you. That's an, and that's an excellent segue to our next session, which is on if we talk about the purpose of a bit challenge system, the, the, the corollary question is once you resolve what the purpose of a bit challenge system, you can begin to identify who should be able to bring a bit challenge. Different purposes yield different different answers to that question of standing. And, and this what we'd like to do is poll the audience um, and ask the audience question in, in response to riotous objections from my panelists. I've checked the box so the panelists actually can vote on this as well. Michael, are you there? <laughs> and I'm going to launch the poll here. If we, if folks could respond to this, I'm going to leave this open for a few seconds. And then just for the panelists, we're going to have, because um, we're running a little short of time, I'm going to ask um, Ana Marie Lakimia to move to the head of the line in just a second and, and speak to this question first, this question of standing. So what we're seeing here in the polling is, and I'm gonna leave it open for another 10 seconds, is that um, there's the substantial support for allowing any bidder to bring, a, uh, to bring a challenge and any party with a direct interest, but not a lot of support for allowing any citizen to, to bring a challenge. And we're gonna hear from some of our panelists that in, in some systems around the world, um, anybody, really anybody um, can, can bring a bid challenge, which is an, an interesting different uh, approach. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling. Thank you very much for that. And um, by the way, we have 180 participants uh, to, with us today. And um, let me share these results. And there we go. And also there's a, there's a broad support for broadening the, um, the standing beyond just the next in line six, uh, unsuccessful bidder to allow any bidder. Okay, and I'm gonna download this. Oh, excuse me, and I'm going to close this, and I'm going to turn to Anna. Anna, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, you have an, you have probably um, as much experience as any of us with I I dealing with issues in development and procurement. You're a specialist in development and human rights. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your perspective on on how bid challenges might address broader questions in procurement and development. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, uh, yes, indeed, I want to talk not about a specific system, but about the importance of the review challenges in the aid sector by making reference to two cases that illustrate how important it is to broaden the pool of people that can bring a claim in front of a judicial authority when aid matters are concerned, and in particular, um, I want to refer to an important case studied by most of the students that do constitutional law in the UK, and um, is the R versus Secretary of State of Foreign Commonwealth Affairs ex parte World Development Movement case, when the World Development Movement claimed that the Foreign Secretary decision to fund the Pergus Dam project in Malaysia was not providing quality aid. Uh, the project, it was claimed there was corruption, was not effective, too much money was spent. But one of the key, key questions was really whether the World Development Movement has standing. And the movement claimed that it represented a broader public interest, including people in developing countries, taxpayers, because uh, it was trying to make sure that the government was spending the money well. And as we know, these are very key questions in the aid sector. The foreign secretary, of course, claimed the opposite, that the world development movement didn't have standing because it wasn't a bidder, it wasn't part in any way to the project. Well, the High Court was satisfied that the world development movement has sufficient interest. And this was a revolutionary case in the UK. And, and also the court uh, regarded that you know, it has standing because of the importance of the issue, because the likely the likelihood of an absence of any challenges whatsoever to the government. And as we will see with the other case at the opposite end of the scale that I'm gonna talk about is an Italian case. This is often what happens in, aid, in the aid sector. There, unless you allow uh, um, an international organization or uh, you allow a group of uh, citizen to bring a challenge, there will be no one challenging the aid project. Well, and in that specific case, the court accepted the argument that although 
the work is, the word is not specifically used in the legislation, aid must be given for sound development projects. So, and the aid money must not be misused and abused. And I said that it's thanks to that case that then important reform to the aid development sector started in the UK. And that case is really said to be at the basis of the International Development Act of 2002 that then started a whole movement of reforms within UK aid. At the opposite spectrum is an Italian case, the Cinca Eno case uh, versus the Minister of Foreign Affairs. In that case, instead, decided in 2007 by the Supreme Administrative Court, the highest administrative court in Italy, the court denied jurisdiction because of the way Italian aid money is given that basically even if the contract is awarded by an Italian agency on the Italian ground following the Italian rules, the contract is signed on behalf of the recipient country. So the court said, well, we don't have jurisdiction. This effectively left a vacuum because no one then challenged the decision. This the decision being stained with corruption, being unfair, um, was against the rule of law and so forth. And, you know, it, unfortunately, then aid money is often tinged with corruption and with cases of inefficiency. And I think that these two different cases really illustrate how big challenges can then improve the aid system in a way that we are not usually thinking about. And I, and I mean, this is now it's very important also in light of the jump case that sees for the first time the US courts claiming that the World Bank can also be sued. So it will be interesting to see how this develops and uh, you know what changes will be brought within the aid system because of these new challenges. So I think you know it's an interesting sector to to check and to keep an eye on. Thank you, Anna. That was very very interesting. As you can, there are a lot of very favorable comments on it from the chat, including some questions that you might post some materials, folks. We're going to have to go a little bit over. Um, we're going to probably go about fifteen to twenty minutes over. I'm going to turn over now to Michael Kanya, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, new experience and, and new rules in Poland, a new approach to allowing a broader standing and for a slightly different public purposes. Michał, if you could talk a little bit about the uh, Polish experience. Sure, thank you very much, Chris. So I would like to address just a couple of remarks concerning the role of the civil, which we call the public organizations and an advocate for small and medium sized enterprises in a bit challenges in Poland. And to put this, uh, this in context, so the starting points relates to the reform of the Polish public procurement regulation. So in January 2021, the new act came into force and it was adopted in 2019. And uh, as a Polish lawyer, based only 400 kilometers from Vienna, I believe that this is the pivotal moment uh, for the Polish public procurement market and legal regulation. So, so this regulation shall help to increase the level of strategic procurements in Poland and support the required understanding of the public interest. And at the big protest level, these aims may be supported by the contribution of the, I would say, non-typical subjects standing to initiate the protest. So we have right now two categories of, uh, categories of such entities. First, public organizations, and the other one, advocate for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. And both are eligible to file the pre-award protest. Uh, we have 151 public organizations entered on the president of public procurement list, uh, office list. A, and they encompass, among others, chambers of commerce, organizations of uh, employers, organizations of architects and uh, urban planners. Uh, the first one has been entered in 2002 and the last one on 21st April this year. And the right of the advocate for small and medium enterprises is completely new, it's brand new. And uh, why we decided to empower civil organizations and advocates um, to contribute to the protest procedure. So there are several reasons, but just let me emphasize three of them. So first, public organizations are expected to implement and protect the public interest in, I would say, more sophisticated when, uh, way than vendors do. The public interest is a roomy general term, uh, and I believe that it, it shall be filled permanently with the required content. Uh, it also encompasses integrity, transparency, and other values. Uh, 
which are important for, for the system. So this is also the public organization's role, in our opinion, to create this feedback loop for the contracting authorities, running a stronger procurement and uh, establishing self-policing system. To advocate this completely brand new um, solution shall trace the practice from the perspective of small and medium enterprises, which in turn were often devastated during uh, COVID and should now play important role in the better post-pandemic world. And in many cases, small and medium enterprises do not have sufficient knowledge and resources to jump into the bid process procedure. So they are trying to find somebody who could support them. And third, we are observing the growing importance, and I think it's, it's, it's really important, of public procurement in the disbursement of funds from the post-pandemic EU reconstruction fund. And this situation, in my opinion, calls for stronger public organizations uh, activity, also in public procurement market. And just a uh, few uh, comments uh, from the practice. So first, for, for, for this webinar, I have uh, been searching for example of protests issued by public organizations. And I have to say that they uh, were still relatively rare, comprising only a few percent of approximately 2,700 protests docked annually in National Appeal Chamber in Warsaw. So it can be connected with the insufficient understanding of the mission by the public organizations, or maybe it was the right number of cases in which the protests were really needed. So for sure, the situation requires more detailed research, but I think that there is this tension between supporting the perfect system versus under disruption of the procurement system by creating too many, I would say, frivolous protesters. And second, an examination of um, even several cases indicates that these organizations were still primarily focused on protecting the interest of individual vendors who requested their assistance. So in fact, they missed the possibility of exercising the power to promote general values relevant to the public interest. We do not have the data concerning the advocate for small and medium enterprises, but I feel that it can be the right way to, 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 to protect the, uh, this public interest in the practice. Thank you very much. Coming back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Um, and Ken Penn, I wonder if you could uh, offer uh, some observations on how GAO deals with this issue of, of accommodating other voices in the bid protest process. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And some of my thoughts actually echo some of the observations made, just made by Mikhail. And that is typically, uh, I think the GAO procurement system uses two frameworks to sort of think about who should be able to protest, that being efficiency and economy. One of the primary purposes, I think, for the procurement system is to ensure that goods and services can be provided to the federal customer so that they can provide goods and services in, to the general public. And in order to do that, you've got to make sure that you can move the procurement along, but still ensure some degree of accountability through the procurement bid protest process. And so at GAO, we have a uh, a different standing requirement than what typically you might find in a federal court in the United States. We have what's called an interested party standard, and it's a little bit of a higher standard than what the courts in the United States apply with respect to typical people who are filing claims to get judicial relief. And here we look to whether or not there is a, an economic interest in the procurement to, in order for us to entertain views by parties. And so what that means is typically we're only looking at somebody who is most likely to win the award, who has an interest in, in fighting the award, because as some of you who may know, the, the US model at GAO uses what's called the attorney's general model of accountability. And so we rely on the private sector, those individuals, those companies that have an interest to bring the matter and to make sure that we are aware of what issues are currently under consideration that are all problematic. And so with that, we generally only hear from the, the person who most likely will win the award. And we will also allow the individual who has won an award to come in and defend their award. We call them an intervener. And so typically those two parties along with the government agency that awarded the contract are involved in the procurement advising GAO of their views, arguments, and, ma and making their claims known. Typically, we require the, the intervener and the agency to make, and the protester, to make all the arguments they can make at that time. If they don't do that, and in a subsequent challenge, we're likely to rule that those claims are time barred. They're untimely because you had an opportunity to make those claims at the time of the initial protest, but you failed to make them. 
And so one of the things that we, we have at GAO to, in order to help us to adjudicate the process is we have a regulatory requirement that allows us to seek views from other parties and other entities that don't necessarily have a direct economic interest in the procurement. And we've used it on occasion to uh, get views from, let's say, sureties who may be uh, putting up bonds for the performance of various contractors. We've used it to get input from entities that may be affected by the outcome of a procurement. Now, the, the decision as to whether or not to utilize this provision is within our discretion. And usually we only allow other parties to provide input when we think it will be helpful to us to resolution of the protest. So another example of that is sometimes there are other federal agencies that have expertise in matters that we don't necessarily have within GAO, or they're given authority to uh, adjudicate certain provisions of US law. And so we might seek out the views of those other agencies to ensure that we have a full and comprehensive view of all the issues that may be at play in a particular big protest. But we don't use it a lot. We use it sparingly because we have 100 calendar days to decide a protest. And so speaking back to that other component of efficiency, we're trying to ensure a balance between making sure that all the rules and regulations are followed with efficiency and speed to make sure that the federal agency can in fact get its procurement back on track. So those are some just some of our, our observations and I, I want to relinquish back to Chris so we can uh, make sure to keep talking through some of these issues. Thank you very much, Ken. That's very interesting. Uh, we're going gonna, we're gonna to change uh, gears now and go back to Hale to talk a little bit about the South African experience, where there's, we're in contrast to the American system, which is relatively, it was relatively stable over time, over the last 100 years. Um, in South Africa, a great deal of change going on right now. And Hale will talk about how that, that social change, the political change, has translated into the question of standing in, in South Africa. Yes, Chris. So um, because of the fact that, that the challenge now is seen as a constitutional matter, um, at least for the pre-award phase of challenge, the normal constitutional um, standing provisions would apply, which under the South African constitution is extremely broad. Um, there's the obvious self-interest standing provisions, but then there's um, uh, in, uh, standings such as um, any party acting as a member of or in the interest of a group or class of persons, or even any party acting in the public interest would have standing. Um, which means that, you know, at least uh, uh, on the face of it, on the pre-award phase, basically anyone can really challenge any uh, uh, procurement um, decision simply because of the public money involved. Um, and, and typically one would see, for example, in a town where uh, 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 the municipality, the local government would take a procurement decision, then a ratepayers association could easily intervene and bring a challenge because they would argue that that particular procurement would not be in the interest of, of the municipality of the local um, community. Uh, and they would certainly have standing to do that. Now, um, most recently, we've also started to test the, the um, ambit of those very broad standing provisions in the post-award phase, where traditionally it's only because of privity of contract that the uh, winning supplier, so the contractor and the state would, would have standing to, to deal with disputes. And, We've most recently had a case by, um, from our Supreme Court of Appeal, our Intermediate Appeal Court, that's confirmed that even a variation decision taken during the implementation of a contract would be open to uh, uh, just an interest group, a third party interest group affected by the work done under um, the relevant uh, uh, contract to, to challenge in, um, in the judicial review uh, proceedings that variation decision. The court overturned. The variation decision um, on procedural fairness grounds, a typical Audi Ultram Partem grounds that uh, the, the public entity did not engage the third party before taking that decision. And that's really now pushed again, um, standing to a much broader level. So we've got extremely broad standing and the wisdom of that, of course, one can, one can um, uh, argue about. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, Hale. It's very, very, very interesting. Um, it, it's fascinating for us as outsiders to watch the constitutionalization of, of this law in, in South Africa and what that means for social justice and social reform in South Africa. Very important. Um, Michael, if we could talk a little bit about how standing has, 
changed in, in the United Kingdom over the course of the pandemic um, and, and how that's and how the United Kingdom might be approaching issues of the course of the United Kingdom. Yeah. And I know you're going to correct me. I know you're going to say it's England, Scotland, <laughs> but how, no, how, how is standing? My tongue is bitten. My tongue is bitten. But the, <laughs> but the standing rules diff are different in the are different in the different jurisdictions. <laughs> uh, so how is things changing? So I mean, the, we start from a, a culture in which uh, the, the basic rule was that the private law challenge, which we've already discussed, was available to all dissatisfied bidders, but that there were, had always been an existing means and in under public law for people with an interest in the procurement to make a challenge certainly unions perhaps and subcontractors but it was the the edges of that were ill-defined but the assumption from the case law was that it was probably uh, unlikely to be much broader than that um what we are seeing to some extent building on the sort of trends one saw in the perga dam case that Anna maria's talked about but a, a range of other cases in a, across public law is that where there is um where the court perceives there might be no challenger, where where where, where they're not, to, where you're not to allow a challenge by a civil society operator, uh, an entity, then 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 the standing rules will be broadened, uh, and that's happened at least in two very recent cases, where the issues were such that the court formed the view that um, that if it wasn't the civil society entity making the allowed to make the challenge, then no bidder would have brought the would have brought the challenge. I think so. We can see a the beginnings of a direction of travel, and that also, to, interestingly, added to that is also a willingness to bring into play more closely um, non-EU derived doctrines. I'll, I'll, I'll have to mix up uh, English public law doctrines and doctrines from uh, our EU derived public procurement law in the case law. I think, well, the important question, the most important question to me going forward is, is how far that will enable one to see challenges brought at an earlier stage to the design of criteria and so forth. Uh, our, that's a topic we haven't really addressed so much here is given all the pressure to um, expand and improve upon the application of sustainability criteria and environment, social and so on and so forth in those areas, that has been an area which generally speaking bidders have little interest in bringing challenges on. And but but culturally, I think the expectation might have been that um, while, the, while it's unlikely that a bidder would challenge, a bidder could challenge, and that was probably enough to keep out the sort of interested third party from challenging, as it were, the, the approach taken to a sustainability aspect of the bid. But I wonder whether or not we might see some more permanent changes in attitude in the judiciary where people will begin, where the judiciary will begin to see, well, actually, if you really mean what you say and that, that sustainability should be baked into this, that or the other uh, aspect of procurement, then you need to allow people to bring um, traditional public law based claims because in reality, bidders will only very rarely be bothered to bring those claims themselves. But uh, that's a that is really me speculating and extrapolating on the basis of a couple of pandemic-based cases. Thank you very much, Michael. Laurent, so I wonder if you could compare the experience in in France and Senegal, a common a common uh, legal tradition, and how but how that common tradition has diverged in in France and Senegal. Yes, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, but may I first raise a, a question or a comment, a general comment, because it strikes, strikes me that uh, we are talking about converging models or converging mechanisms coming from different legal backgrounds, different origins and purposes. Like in the US, it was more about uh, enforcement of uh, financial rules. In France, it was more about uh, legality and judicial review in the tradition of a strong administrative law perspective. And in other countries, it was, it was uh, pushed by the trade issues, like in Canada, New Zealand is as well uh, um, in that case. And, um, and today, um, so in Africa, it's more driven by governance issues. 
So what is striking me is that we have this converging movement, while at the same time, it is still so diverse within the United States, among the, the states themselves. So it's interesting to, to consider this difference. So by the way, uh, comparing the French system and the Senegalese system is interesting because uh, they are both rooted into the, I would say the French uh, tradition, of course, because Senegal, like other uh, countries in the West Africa part were a uh, former French colony. But uh, even though the administrative law and the judicial review was already there, what was really important in Senegal was uh, the intervention of the World Bank and other multilateral institutions, uh, which pushed for a reform creating an administrative body, administrative regulatory body in charge of not only uh, the regulation of procurement system, but also uh, of the challenge mechanism. And it is very important to understand that almost in all country in Africa, you have this uh, unique model, uh, not everywhere, but in many, many countries. And actually it originated in Senegal. It was created in Senegal. And then uh, this model was uh, used uh, for the, when they were preparing the directive for the YMU, uh, the Western African uh, Monetary Union. And so this is why you have the same administrative body. So it's a little bit like the GAO, but uh, with <laughs> different uh, background and, and powers. But what is interesting is that today, since this type of administrative body and their challenge mechanism are quite working well in otherwise a quite uh, disruptive environment, expectations in this area are growing. And so now they start to think that maybe we should be also in charge of uh, challenge regarding the public domain or challenge regarding other issues. And so it's, go it's going very far away from the, the single question of the legality of the procurement system. So that's it. Thank you very much, Laurence. Thank you very, very much. Um, Gabriele, do you want to make can a I, can, can I ask a quick question to Laurence on this? I was sure. wondering in Africa whether the proliferation of these administrative challenge bodies was in any way connected or related or the result of, at least in part, uh, pressures from funding organizations like the World Bank or the African Development Bank. Did that have anything to do with it? Well, I'm not saying that it was only done under this pressure, but Clearly, uh, the, the preparation of the procurement directives of the YMU was uh, prepared with the World Bank and, uh, and the African Development Bank. And so they, they, they used this model of the procurement regulatory body coming from Senegal, suggested by Senegal, uh, as a common way to handle these uh, specific uh, issues. And it was considered to be a good answer to an uh, otherwise uh, uh, dysfunctional uh, justice system. So there was no more trust into the judicial body. And so it was seen as the best way for resolving quickly the procurement issues to create this uh, administrative regulatory body. But actually it created some issues because uh, the French system, the French legal background is not organized <laughs> to uh, welcome such agency coming within the system. So they, it has created a lot of adjustment issues. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Gabriele, did you want to make a brief intercession on the role of the, uh, the anti-corruption agency in, in terms of bringing big challenges in Italy? Uh, yes, this is a novelty in Italy and it's a, a, an important effect because uh, it comes out from the parties and uh, bring the interest, the public interest. And so many in, in some case, a few cases when uh, this has been uh, the, the National Anti-Corruption Authority uh, brought the, the cases uh, that gave a very, very uh, el a gr great help in uh, finding corruption and uh, misuse of public money. But just a word, because as a reaction of uh, what I heard, uh, the post-pandemic uh, uh, crisis and now the, the recovery funds that was mentioned before in Europe and in Italy, especially in Italy, it may helps us and turn into digitalization and e-procurement and procurement platform with uh, through, uh, through new tools. And, and this would, could help also in simplifying the big challenges because everything could be there. 
So I think the digital transformation will really uh, help Italy and maybe not only to, to transform the way to procure and also the, the way to, um, to monitor the use of public money. So this is uh, my idea for the future. And so also the, the line of research that uh, we are launching for the future. Thank you very much. This is Gabriela's general way of reminding me that we need to get working on our book on digitalization. Thank you, Gabriela. <laughs> okay, we want to turn to the next question. If, and if I could ask um, Manny Johannes's patience for just one second, because we're going to lose Peter. Um, Peter, I wonder if you could <laughs> talk a little bit about the third question. We're going to close on this third question. How often do bid challenges arise? Are they disruptive and are they expensive? Peter, if you could speak to that. Yeah, no, I'd love to. I mean, I was just listening to, to Laurence's comments and I have to respond to Paul's question as well to say in most developing countries, yes, it's all a question of, of following the conditionalities oh, or the encouragement, should I say, of the, of the donors and the MDBs. And that's a little bit the problem about trying to, to, to put in place a system which was designed for some of the more mature countries that we've been hearing about today. Um, I was interested in, in terms of the, the question of damages. Well, in most of the developing countries, damages is wholly unacceptable to the governments who are putting this in place. So let's forget that to start with. Um, but then we have some other, some, uh, some other, other problems and, and that comes a little bit to Ken's um, comment about, uh, you know, you're, you're using bidders to, to give you a, uh, an idea of what the alleged breach is. So people with knowledge of a possible breach are the ones that are going to raise the question. But in many developing countries, what tends to be happening is that, and, and these are from countries who don't want to give up control in a sense, you know, they're, they're used to having direct supervision and monitoring all the time. So suddenly to put in place a, a bid challenge mechanism makes them feel uncomfortable. And so what tends to happen is that when, when a case comes to a, a panel, it's not just the question that's being asked. It's not a dispute resolution question. It's, oh, now we've got a chance to look at the whole process. So they start reviewing all sorts of things and then the time goes by and, and you know, all sorts of things come in that are completely irrelevant. Um, and and it, I think it causes huge disruption in some, of these, um, in some of these countries. And then this also brings us to the question of the role of the adjudicators. And there was a question earlier on about who these adjudicators are. Well, yes, it would be lovely to have people who know about procurement and who are lawyers and the judges and so forth. But in the developing world, that's a luxury that doesn't exist. So we're trying to find people who, um, they're generally politicians, I have to say. Occasionally, if you're lucky, you'll, you'll get some lawyers and you may have people who are, who are familiar with procurement, but that's, that's more an exception to the rule. And they gen generally tend to be politicians who've been involved in approving or supervising procurement before. And it, it brings up this question of what, what you know, what are, they, what are they going to be doing? Because uh, we have to train them, capacity is very low. And many donors say, well, we have to train them in procurement. Yes, and the result of that is to make them think they know more about procurement than the people who do it every day. And the tendency is to want to second guess and to say, well, actually you've got the wrong procurement decision. So we'll say, this is what you should have decided rather than just looking at the question that is um, before them. And so from my point of view, I always think it's much better to try to provide capacity building on dispute resolution. How do you actually resolve a dispute rather than how do you make a procurement decision? That's really where the issue is. If you're looking at bid protests, if you're looking at, at challenges. I mean, procurement questions, are, it does happen and all the big cases we know are about wonderful procurement principles. But at the end of the day, most procurement cases are about who said, said what, when, and where's the document to prove it. And really, you just have to weigh up the evidence and, and resolve the dispute on that basis. It's not a free for all for, you know, setting out new procurement principles. Of course, the big cases are, I'm not disputing that, but the majority of cases are not. So I think, you know, putting in this, this mature system into an immature procurement scenario causes lots of disruption and, and I think that that's something we need to be aware of. I'll stop there because I know we're, we're running out of time. Thank you Peter, that was very very useful. 
So from most of the audience members don't know that Matt Carter uh, played baseball at, at a very, very high collegial level with collegial level, which is something that the rest of us as Americans are endlessly admir in admiration of. So Matt, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, as a very accomplished bid protest lawyer, I'm gonna throw you a curveball. <laughs> That's it. Do you think as, a, as an accomplished bid protest lawyer, do you think that bid protests are expensive and disruptive? <laughs> Well, I think uh, starting with whether they're disruptive, I think from my perspective, uh, the answer is no. Um, I think as David mentioned earlier, the statistics show that less than 1% of government contract awards are actually protested. Uh, second, as Ken mentioned, uh, protests in the United States are resolved relatively quickly. Uh, at the GAO by statute, protests have to be resolved within 100 days. And at the Court of Federal Claims, typically uh, parties will agree to expedited briefing um, if the protest needs to be resolved quickly. Uh, in addition, as uh, Christina mentioned, there's no disruption to the underlying services. Uh, this is because in follow-on procurements, typically the incumbent contractor will continue to perform under a bridge contract until the protest is resolved. I think the most important point when we're thinking about disruption, you know, any minor disruption caused or resulting from a protest has to be weighed in terms of the effectiveness of the protest process. And at the GAO, where most protests are filed in the United States, there was a 51% effectiveness rate in fiscal year 2020. And what this means is that in over half of the protests that were filed, the agency either took voluntary corrective action or the GAO sustained the protest. So I think when you take all of that together, uh, protests are not disruptive and certainly not highly disruptive in the United States. And kind of turning to your second question on expense, well, it really depends on the forum that's selected for protesting. Um, agency level protests are relatively low cost. They're informal and the protesters role is usually limited to the initial filing of the protest document. But I think most members of the protest bar would tell you uh, that agency protests are not worth the time and money. And this is because agency officials tasked with reviewing protests typically just rubber stamp the prior agency action at issue. Now, Court of Federal Claims protests are generally more expensive than GAO protests. And this is for several reasons. First, as was previously mentioned, there's no automatic stay of performance at the Court of Federal Claims like there is at the GAO. Instead, at the court, a protester has to file, brief, and argue uh, for either a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction. Also at the court, it's more formal process. There are more filings than at the GAO. And then kind of the final key point is um, at the court, typically there's one or more hearings where in contrast at the GAO in fiscal year 2020, uh, hearings were held in only 1% of the cases. So taking these and other factors into consideration, the court is the most expensive form in the United States. But I think while protests can be expensive and cost, you know, some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars, those costs are relatively minuscule when we're talking about awards that can be valued in the tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. I think that, that answers those questions, Chris. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Um, so, and Johannes Schnitzer, who is, who is the, on the client side, he's got perspectives on bid protests. So do you, do you think that bid challenges are, are expensive and disruptive, Johannes? Um, yeah, it depends, Chris. Uh, it depends. Uh, I fully agree what Justin Matt mentioned. At the agency level, typically not. But in many jurisdictions, actually, uh, we need to take into account a couple of different cost buckets. And in many jurisdictions, actually, just the court fee in order to file a bid protest might be up to 1%. And 1% might, might, might be a lot. Also, typically, when we are engaging in, in bid protests, so I said private bidder, if a private bidder is, is doing a bid protest, you always need outside counsel, like Roland, who is then working over the weekend. Uh, we we in-house lawyers, we, we try not to do this anymore. But obviously, very often, you end up easily in six-digit figure numbers just, just for outside counsel. And then I think that the second cost bucket, which is really very important, it takes a lot of leadership time. Uh, there, is, there are senior partners involved, there are folks from the proposal team involved, at least one, one member from the legal department. So those are also costs. I'm not saying this is one of, I think it's, it's one, something we would factor in, what are the chances of success and what, what are the costs. Uh, but obviously this is something we, what we need to take into account. Uh, 
what I think is also very important, uh, what has been discussed um, earlier is uh, standing. And what I see in many jurisdictions actually that only a company which can suffer a damage has legal standing. And what we are seeing actually is that bid protests are getting highly, highly formalistic. And in many jurisdictions, there's actually case law that a company who submitted a non-responsive bid actually has no legal standing because the argument is, if you do not manage to, to submit a compliant bid, you could never win the contract. And for this reason, actually, you could never suffer a damage. And then the issue is actually that public procurement became so complicated and so formalistic, and it's really tough to table a fully compliant bid. And I think what Peter mentioned earlier, in bid protests, very seldom, to be honest, it's really talking about who offered the best um, tender, talking about, I don't know, fair, fair treatment and, and non-discrimination. Very often, it's really that the judge is just looking at the offer and looking for any minor formal mistake. I don't know, in a subcontractor declaration on page 17, the managing partner did not sign. Uh, it was, I don't know, a, a scant uh, signature. So again, very often, I would say that big challenges are rejected for purely formalistic reasons. I think this is also something I um, wanted to factor in. And then the third uh, reason why sometimes I think the odds of success in challenging bids are, are slim uh, has to do with um, no effective, effective system for appeals. So very often in the co first co court um, and first instance, you have suspensive effect. So the, the, the court is actually pausing the procurement. Uh, but very often, if the company actually is losing and then appealing, very often the court of appeal is not pausing, is not suspending the, the bid protest. And from a private bidder perspective, we don't care about damages. It's not about damages in, in, in bid protest. It's about winning a public contract. It's about obtaining a reference project. And most important, it's, it's, it's about having impact and having a happy customer. So it's not about um, damages. So this is also something what I see in, in many jurisdictions actually, uh, where public procurement becomes so formalistic that sometimes it, it's not even worth uh, bringing a, a bit protest. And although obviously it, it's not a legal issue, but uh, I haven't seen a lot of cases with let's say nasty procurement litigation, which has led to fruitful business relationships which might be, but which obviously depends on the type of, of, of goods or services. I think if you are supplying services, it, it's, it's not so, so critical. But for instance, as a management consulting company, which then is working together with a client over a couple of months, bid protests just might have an, an impact on the business relationship. So actually we are very careful when it comes to, to let's say, uh, suing our clients. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, I'm going to um, beg the deep indulgence of, uh, of Roland and Gabriel and just go to our, our last intercession from Andrea Sundstrand in, in Sweden, and because uh, we're, we're running over on time. Um, Andrea, I, I wonder if you could just take a moment to discuss um, the experience in Sweden, how, they, how, how the costs of um, bid protests, closing out on this question whether or not bid protests or, or bid challenges are expensive and disruptive, how the costs of bid challenges are managed in Sweden. for asking me to participate. Uh, you can hear me. The video is a little off, Andrea, but we can hear you. OK. Um, well, we have a lot of bid protests in Sweden. We actually have about 2,500 a year in the first instance. About, about 800 of those are appealed to the um, appeal court, and about uh, three, four hundred of them are allowed. Uh, yet um, uh, are allowed in the second uh, stage, and of those, about a hundred are appealed to the uh, Supreme Court, Supreme <clears throat> or High Administrative Court. And of them, about four or five actually are allowed. So it's a very steep, um, steep ladder. But I think the reason we have so many cases is that we allow bid protests uh, also below the EU threshold. So also for our national procurements, 
so even for a procurement for 50,000 euros, you would be able to do a bid protest. And of course, um, a lot of the contracting authorities have been complaining to the government that they think that there are too many bid protests. So the government was thinking about um, to, to adopt provisions on some kind of fees, because in Sweden, we have two different systems. We have an administrative court system and a civil court system. And appeals against public procurements are made in the administrative court system, and that is free of charge. On the other hand, you don't get any, as a regular, you don't regularly, you don't get any, um, uh, you don't get your costs covered. And we all know um, lawyers are expensive, so for small and medium-sized enterprises, it could be even if it doesn't cost anything to go to court, it could be still a, a huge cost. Because as someone earlier said, these proceedings do tend to get complicated legally. And you actually do need to have a lawyer to, if you're going to ha have a successful case. Uh, but uh, what happened actually was there's so much protests against this also on the fact that to protect small and medium-sized enterprises, it would be bad to have a fee because maybe they would feel they couldn't afford it. And then the whole idea of helping them um, in public procurements would be lost. Also, it could be against the EU directives, actually. If you have a too high fee, you would actually deny the suppliers their right to remedies according to the directives. If if you would have a, a fee that actually would deter them to, to ask for, uh, for or, or appeal against the procurement decision. So, um, so what's the solution? Well, we actually a couple of years ago, there was uh, some of the insurance companies who started to sell insurances, um, like any legal assurance you have as a company, if you, if you get into a, um, a dispute with someone and you have to go to court, you can have your legal costs covered. And of course, these insurances also covers if you want to appeal in a public procurement, but they are rather expensive. So for small and medium sized enterprises, it wouldn't be interesting anyway. But what happened a couple of years ago is that we had a court case that said that uh, if you are a supplier, and, and this was in the civil courts. So the civil courts decided that if you were a supplier in a public procurement and, to, and you didn't get the contract and you, decided, you, you thought something was wrong, and to, um, to guard your own rights, you had to appeal against that decision. And if you later won, that would um, be something you had to do to protect your legal rights. And in that case, you would actually get your, cover, your costs covered from the contracting authority who did the wrong thing. Uh, and this has been, of course, very much debated in Sweden because it's not the other way around. If the supplier loses, the contracting authority doesn't get its, its uh, costs covered and they are also regularly turning to lawyers to get help in these uh, proceedings. Uh, but that is still where we are. And now is another case coming up in the civil courts where we're talking, because the, generally in the administrative courts, you don't get your costs covered. It doesn't cost anything, but you don't get your costs. But now we have another case coming up with, that isn't on public procurement, but will affect public procurement. And it's the same situation where a woman had to go to court to defend her legal rights according to the union law. And the question is in the administrative court and she's asking for her cause because I had to do this and this authority was wrong. So we're all very excited to see if, if actually the civil courts will say, yes, you do have right to get your costs covered in the administrative courts if you are protecting a, a EU fundamental right, like participating in a procurement or getting a certain employment or whatever, if they have been proven wrong, if, if the authorities actually did something that was not correct according to the union law. 
So um, it's still a big question because we have so many court cases. And of course, we have a lot of happy lawyers in Sweden, but um, there are a lot of, um, as I guess in all countries, um, discussions are, is it really good that we have so many court cases? What can we do to bring them down, the numbers? Can we have some speed in the courts? Uh, because usually it takes about six months in the first instance, and maybe eight or nine months in the second. And if you go all the way, it takes more an, an additional year. So we have a lot of, of questions, but uh, cost is definitely one of them. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. So I think we're, we've run out of time. I'm gonna close out with a, um, a, a final poll. And once again, I'm going to um, make the polling available for um, our panelists as well. This is really a poll about what, what the purposes of protest should be. And in many ways, we, we heard a very diverse set of, of um, purposes before. This really boils it down to two of the most common, which is which. what's the primary purpose from your perspective, and this is for both the panelists and for the participants, what's the primary purpose of a bid challenge system in your home jurisdiction? Is it to make the wrong vendors whole to vindicate their rights or to provide oversight over procurement agencies and disclose corruption mistakes? This is really a critical starting point question for a bid challenge system, because once you figure out this purpose, then it shapes all the other questions. It informs all the other questions we've gone through. And quite frankly, in the United States, it, it, both purposes run side by side, but there could be other purposes, such as the ones that, that Paul Alon talked about in terms of vindicating trade issues, and that Geo talked about in terms of dealing with social justice issues of the constitutionalization of this, of this field. So again, this is an oversimplification, over and narrow, but I'd be, we're very curious to hear the the perspectives of participants on the on these two these two core purposes are bid challenges really about the protesters or, or the challengers or are they about protecting the the state or protecting the government making sure the problems are, are discerned by the way the uh, CSIS um, the the Center for Strategic um, and International Studies the CSIS um, uh, organization in Washington held a very interesting conference on this five years ago. That YouTube video is available on the Public Procurement International website. I encourage you to look at that because they dealt with these issues um, squarely when they were dealing with uh, Defense Department procurements in the United States. So I think we'll close out the polling there and we see a strong support, um, roughly two to one, in support of uh, the idea that protests or challenges are really about um, protecting the making serving as an early warning system uh, for procurement systems. So thank you very much for that. And I want to thank uh, very much to the to our panelists for a, what I found a fascinating, fascinating discussion. And I hope you all can join us in the future for other webinars. And again, have a wonderful day. Again, th this recording will be available on our Public Procurement International website in the next hour or so, as soon as I can get my act together and get it up onto YouTube. And then uh, the, the it'll also be available on the GW Law Government Procurement Law Program on our YouTube webpage, where we have all our previous webinars and other training materials as well. Thank you all, and, um, and have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody.